What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Energy News Beat podcast, January 8th, 2024. Here are our top headlines for the day. Starting off, standard chartered oil demand growth to remain robust in 2024 and 2025. Next up, 75 U.S. lawmakers now support CBDC anti-surveillance bill. Interesting one there. Next up, Gavin Newsom's 10 favorite myths about energy and climate. Refuted, though. Um, Great article. Next up, takeover talks trigger rally at beleaguered BP. Spicy one here. Finally, BRICS expands footprint in the global south. I will then quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas finance segments. Markets up high, um, but oil does fall about three percentage points, mainly off the back of Saudi cutting its official selling price. Um, And then all of that, we will send you out of here to get your day started. I'm Michael Tanner, joined as always by the executive producer of the show, the purveyor of the show, and the director and publisher of the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. Stuart Curley, how are you doing today? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and for our podcast listeners, you and I should have called ahead because we both got blue shirts on today. We do. Hopefully, that's uh, hopefully that's a sign of good things to come. But let's go and kick this off, Stu. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our buddies over there at Standard Charter. Uh, I I thought this was pretty funny, Michael. There's only three real quick bullet points here. Standard Chartered has predicted the oil demand growth in the current year will clock in at a robust 1.5 million barrels per day and a 1.41 in 2021. That's demand growth. Uh, The analysts have predicted that the global monthly demand will move above the 104 million barrels per day for the first time in August 2024, eclipsing 105 in august 2025 i'll tell you what um for all them folks that were saying was it the over at the iea oil's dead ding dong the the wicked witch is dead um and then all these people got data what's up with data well i think i think it's because as 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 energy becomes cheaper more people are going to want to use it so there's this there's this interesting combination that if if energy was free we'd use as much as possible as prices go down we will begin to use more you know specifically on the oil side we're going to use more oil it's part of the reasons why these cuts that we're seeing from saudi arabia they're meant to bring prices up because the less oil on the market price goes up so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that as you make energy cheaper people will consume more of this now they're coming out on a limb here and really on a limb in terms of public sentiment if you know obviously the eia and the iea are in sort of limbo they think there's going to be short-term demand growth remember the the ieas came out and said we're going to see probably record production in 2024 but it's then going to cap and peak at somewhere around 2025 2026 and then go on down Obviously, Standard Charter is not necessarily saying that. They're saying huge demand growth in 2024, slightly less, but still more demand growth in 2025. And you can only imagine that these, um, you know, um, and then they also say, you know, that the oil demand growth uh, post will remain in the longer term averages, which means we're going to see growth. We're, we're going to see less growth. What does that mean? We're growing, but at a slower rate. The acceleration of growth is slowing down. So um, love this article um, from Standard Charter. We love their analysis. You know, they also um, ha- have come out, you know, obviously they're fairly bullish. Um, they do expect China to lead those pro- projected demand growths um, with China projected to see an uptick in demand to the tune of about 500,000 barrels per day in 2024 and about 375,000 in 2025. Well, um, well, India clocks in second with their growth expected to be somewhere around 329,000 um, in 2024 and 373,000 in 2025. So you actually see India as the larger growth opportunity, but yet China still with the largest gross um, um, uptick in demand growth. So very interesting. We love this report. What's next? Let's go to 75 U.S. lawmakers now support CBDC anti-surveillance bill. 
Michael, CBDC is not something you smoke. It's actually central bank digital currency, which I am way against. I just thought I'd let you know. Okay. And here's my prediction on this article and for Bitcoin. I think you're going to see cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin, go big. People uh, are afraid of central bank currencies, and I couldn't applaud more. Anybody mining for Bitcoin, home run. So let's go to this. Uh, the bill, specifically the bill prohibits the Federal Reserve and the Federal Open Market Committee from using any central bank digital currency to implement monetary policy. Mm. Michael, when they did, the mechanism's already in place. The, uh, they've already built it. It's already there. They're waiting for a crisis to put it in place. Once they do that, I read another article over the weekend. And Michael, are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. If you don't, uh, if you post anything on social media and you have an electric car, they can shut your car down because you bought extra charging. Wow. They can shut your charging down with wow. this. They don't want you driving out of town. So your credit cards won't work past 15 miles. So this is something that is horrific about control. Yeah. Central bank digital currencies give me the heebie jeebies. You know, oh. it's really a way to implement mass amounts of really just, you know, countrywide censorship. You know, you, you, you've purchased too much meat. You've done this, you've done that. Now we can just cut off your access to literally the markets. I mean, right. you know, I mean, we talk about what SWIFT did by reshaping the way the Russian economy has to operate when they don't have access to all of these banks. Not saying that I agree or disagree necessarily with that decision, but it can become a very nightmare for people when, when you get cut off from the banking system. It's exactly what I think a central bank digital currency is designed to right. do. It's designed to give the, the Fed more power. So I applaud these 75 um, Congress uh, men and women for uh, uh, taking on this. Absolutely. And there was a, a bunch of folks running around saying, oh, uh, Biden was going to announce uh, that he was going to recall the dollar. Uh, and I don't have any idea if that was true or not. But boy, now that you see that the thing's been implemented, that's the first step that they do. OK, let's go to Gavin Newsom. Mm -hmm. Ten favorite myths about energy, climate, and uh, it is refuted and uh, did you know you and I have talked on the podcast about our buddy, good uh, Gavin Newsom? Yep. Uh, if he dives into the uh, ocean there, they're going to blame it on Exxon for an oil spill. He's got so much oil in his hair. I guarantee you, you know, penguins would be dying. Yeah, that's that. the most prolific oil field in California is Gavin yeah. Newsom's hair piece. Oh, yeah. They just kind of go do a get it out of his do rag. I love me a do rag out there. I always wore one when the kids that's were funny. Little. Okay, myth number one, uh, Newsom's energy policy drives progress. <laughs> mm. I don't think that, I'm going to vote on that. All of our listeners that listen to the podcast, if you have any others that should be added to this list, call us. Myth number two, supporters of fossil fuel are climate change deniers. <laughs> climate changes, it's called seasons. OK, um, I'm and, and remember, I, I say this, I've said this frequently. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember when it was global warming and they did the sleight of hand to climate change. It's the shell game, Michael. Yes. I talked about it this morning on the on the energy uh, realities now that instead of that, and it's the shell game with no P. And all you're doing is moving it around. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Myth number three, 97% of climate scientists agree that we face a climate crisis that requires the rapid elimination of fossil fuels. <laughs> the gong. Uh, no, that is, that is not true. In fact, uh, we love our uh, interview with Patrick uh, Moore. He's now, I mean, that is one sharp cat, founder of uh, mm. Greenpeace. Myth number four, California is a climate leader. 
Um, <laughs> no, in fact, they are a leader in the highest prices of energy to the consumers and the greatest highest prices for U-Haul trucks leaving California. I'm not kidding. Okay. Let's go here. Myth number five, the U.S. should lead COP28 in committing to net zero by 2050. I love what uh, it says. Truth. Net zero by 2050 is a death sentence to any economy that adopts it. China won't. In right. the developing world, the desperately needs fossil fuels. The U.S. should be leading the way in energy freedom, which I like. And oh, yeah. Look at the myth number six. There is a graphic. If we could have our producer pull this graphic in installed electric capacity in California, solar and wind in 2013. There's the yellow bar. That's about what? 10 percent uh, yep. estimated there. Then you have 2022 solar and wind goes to probably 65 but the reliable capacity mm. <laughs> drops down and i wonder how much money that was let's go to myth just number a few seven. trillions no worries oh yeah what's a few trillion between friends uh california's grid is the model for the u.s look at that graph chart uh Ooh. miss producer if you could pull this in residential electricity prices it is going up at a dramatic price uh, California is myth number eight, solving solar and winds with batteries. One day of world energy, uh, 460 million megawatts, one trillion in Tesla mega packs, 190 trillion. Next, I'm not even going to argue with that one. Myth number nine, uh, ice ban is a model for the U.S. <laughs> We got to get the, this picture up here. August 25th, 2023, CA announces gasoline car ban. Seven days later, California tells citizens not to charge their EVs. Oops. <laughs> um, Oops. And, and then there was another California man uh, two months ago. He ordered an, a Tesla. I want me a Tesla Cybertruck. It's bulletproof. I need one. Just, you know, our fans love me, but not that much. And so when I, what I, what I want to do is uh, when you sit back and take a look, this man ordered a EV. He then, uh, the electric company told him that he had to have another complete hundred meg circuit come into his house. And then he wanted to add a, another, uh, something else EV and they said oh you got to have a third but yet we don't have any available so you can't even get an EV to charge at home so California cannot add enough power I thought that was pretty cool so let's go on to myth number 10 CA's anti-oil efforts are a model for the U.S. look at this graphic these oil companies are ripping us off. They think that the oil companies are actually ripping them off when it's actually uh, how they're doing all their policies. Yeah, I, I don't know who wrote um, Gavin Newsom's energy policy, but uh, he they, was uh, definitely some um, IR guy of the week that got fired. So yeah. former IR guy of the week. All right, former. what's next? I love this next one. Oh, isn't it fun? Takeover talks triggers rally at beleaguered BP. Michael, you can't buy this kind of entertainment. I picked this one out just for you. I knew this would make your day. Uh, BP has a market cap of more than uh, 80 billion uh, pounds, which would probably make uh, any offer one of the biggest in the world. 80 billion pounds. Um I thought this was pretty far. Brent Crows, uh, let's see, where it is it? Absence of a permanent chief executive, a less inhibited balance sheet, and lowly valuation may also catch the eye. This is between BP and Shell. Uh, Shell. Yeah, I mean, so I guess what's what's the rumor here? The the, the rumor came out a, a little earlier this week and, and into the weekend that BP could possibly set itself up to merge with somebody, the, the, the two mega cap companies that came out as, as possible suitors you know obviously the first one is shell them both being kind of european style con uh, companies right. um could that be a good merger chevron while they also just bought hess could also emerge as 
a you know a possible suitor. I just think the interesting part is this is this is obviously going to take some time with a market capitalization of you said more than eighty billion. It would make this by far the largest basically takeover in the oil and gas business in a hot minute, specifically in twenty twenty four and twenty twenty three. Right. You have to remember last at the end of last year, CEO Bernard Looney. CEO of the holding company, and then also right. CEO of BPX, David Lowler, both left over in mysterious circumstances. You know, I don't want to, I don't right. want, you know, rumor mill on why BPX CEO Doug Lowler left. I'll, I'm going to leave that up to the rumor mill. I've heard some things, but I don't want to say anything specific. No. We do know that uh, Bernard Looney had, had, had some good times with his former employee, with his, uh, with his subordinates and probably got a little too friendly with them. Oh, um, sure. Causing probably a little bit of an HR issue, which specifically caused them to not pay him the $32 million in pay and bonuses over the life of his contract over, quote, serious misconduct. So that quote you mentioned, Stu, you've got no CEO. You've got a, a pretty indebted company right now that's trading at a at a fairly low valuation relative to its super market cap peers. Right. And the ability for if rate cuts do come, They'll be one of the companies lined up to take advantage of it. We very, they very well might be able to be acquired for something that's an attractive target for somebody. Now the right. question is, how do you piece together? Do you keep BPX as part of the portfolio? Do you sell BP and, and to, to 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 Shell, and then you rip off BPX to somebody in the United States? Does Chevron take BPX? Does Shell take? Uh, right. BP and, and and you you know there's a they got a lot of stuff going on you they, know to give you guys an idea you know I mean they've got uh you know assets all over the world they've got you know they they have some stuff in Libya they've got um you know a multiple of international projects we know things in the North yep. Sea have hit well we do know they have a a pretty uninvestable renewables division which seems to you know how all this stuff gets weighed in a potential deal is is hilarious and how much they're valuing, you know, you, some of these you nailed other the big, the big, uh, squirrel in the room, um, uh, eating his nuts is, is the fact that shell and BP went after the renewables at such a rate, their investors squeaked, um, very, very loudly when the profits didn't come in and they lost billions uh, out of their renewables. Mm -hmm. So the European um, uh, oil companies lost it big, and the U.S. didn't go as big. Yep. So anyway, uh, so if you get Shell and BP to merge, you're going to get an uglier baby. It's, it's still got three arms. All right, okay. what's next? <laughs> Let's go to BRICS. Hey, you heard it here a second. The other day when I uh, said that uh, Putin's going to be the uh, new president, it is now official. Uh, Putin is the president of BRICS for this year, and it is going to be expanding. Uh, uh, this is just amazing. August, the bloc had announced that it would be admitting six new members. Um, but now Putin um, is really sweetening the pot for, I believe it's 30 more. Let me look at the number here. Are we uh, now that Putin's president of BRICS? Are we finally going to get able to apply as a podcast? Uh, yes, I think Putin's actually going to sponsor the podcast because he's seen our uh, imitations of him. Hey, you know, he's he's all jealous that uh, he's now watching the shark over the tank. So as the five, uh, let's see, where is it? He's I think there's about 30 that he's planning on bringing on board. That's huge. It is. Uh, it's it's going to be absolutely crazy. BRICS is becoming kind of the new powerhouse in the world, considering you have the G7 on one side, which is the United, the United States, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Great Britain, Japan. And then you have all of these other countries, these BRICS members. You know, I definitely think Argentina is going to be one country to watch out for to get in there. We know Saudi has now joined. We know that the BRICS is almost becoming the new OPEC in terms of global oil control. It will be, uh, because uh, also, uh, you heard it here a second, Japan may be, this is my opinion, don't have the facts in yet. What I'm uh, trying to say is, when you sit back and take a look, um, Japan, you heard it here first, 
Japan may be leaving the G7 in a few years because if if the United States weaponizes uh, more pipelines to China, I mean to Japan, Japan is already uh, grumpy enough at the U.S. that they're taking energy deals and setting them up, being quiet about mm -hmm. it. I guarantee you. Japan is going to be in bricks and Japan is going to go away from the G7 because we are interesting. Idiots. So now that's a prediction right there. That is, you heard it here second. And mm -hmm. I guarantee you, I've gone on the record. If that happens, you're going to go back. Stu was right twice. Blind mice finds cheese every once in a while. Hey, one last one. As nuclear debate nears, French minister uh, sees potential for 14 new reactors. Had a great interview this morning with uh, John Cash. He's with Your uh, Energy. It's UR-Energy. He's a uranium mining company in the U.S. Pretty cool. We had a fabulous talk. Uh, France has got uh, fit, uh, ballpark 52 re, uh, reactors they're only running 25 percent so now they're adding up to 14 reactors so they can sell it to germany nope. <laughs> sell the power to germany. <laughs> you can't buy this kind of entertainment no it's it's absolutely insane that's a great interview we'll definitely have to check that out um when you release it uh, whenever we get production, we got a bunch coming. We got a bunch more interviewing. We got lots of stuff cooking. Yeah. Well, we'll go ahead and switch over to finance, guys. But before we do that, as always, remember, guys, the news and analysis that you've heard and are about to hear is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job of making sure that website stays up to speed with everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear. Hit the description below to see all the different links, timestamps, and ways to interact with the show. But moving on to finance, we saw overall markets actually up uh, fairly decent today. We saw NASDAQ climb two percentage points. S&P 500 up 1.5 percentage points, you know, really on the on, on the cusp of all time highs, 30 year yields um, drop about a quarter percentage point dollar index stays fairly flat, only down about one fifteenth of a percentage point. Bitcoin up big forty six thousand dollars on the brink of forty seven thousand dollars. That's about six point seven percent on the day. We did see crude oil tumble somewhere around three percentage points. Brent crude oil stays the same at about seventy seven. We'll talk about the difference there. Natural gas actually saw briefly above three dollars today, stumbled back down to two dollars and ninety one cents. Going back to crude oil, though, Stu, I think the main reason why we see oil falling was, was Saudi Arabia slashing what's known as their OPS, their official selling price, which is basically their stated selling price for all of their crude. To give you guys an idea, they slashed it more than $2 um, a barrel to only $1 um, or excuse me, they slashed their official selling price by $2 a barrel um, to $1.50 a barrel, which is, again, it used to be $3.50 um, between that Omar and Dubai quotes. Um, this is the biggest price cut in 13 months. It's in line with market expectations as refiners have been calling for a while now for Saudi Arabia um, to, to, to make their middle their crude a little bit more uh, affordable relative to other Middle Eastern producers, specifically from that arbitrage across the Atlantic. You know, a uh, quote out of, uh, you know, a trader from a North Asian refinery. Saudi crude is still relatively more expensive compared to other regional crude. We are happy to see such prices making it much more affordable. Us So Saudi coming in and having to cut a little bit. You know, this is all despite their 2.2 million barrel per day cuts of OPEC plus, um, you know, it's clear that these market participants aren't terribly convinced um, that this reduction will be enough to stop a pretty big buildup of global inventories. As we saw demand, um, as we talked earlier in the show, demand seems to continue to grow, which only means that these global, larger global inventories uh, will be helpful. Now, do we think there's, I'm going to, do I think there's going to be a massive price rally due to all this? Eh, it remains to be seen. It depends. You know, if you're Jeff Curry, who's now the, the University of Chicago Center for Energy Research. He's the new head over there at University of Chicago. I saw him on a quote yesterday. Energy is the most investable industry in America right now. And yes. I, he obviously hasn't looked at any shale companies' financials. So I saw one quote. It's from our friend WTI Realist. He quoted it and said, local man announces he's no longer being drug tested. 
That was the quote from, and I was, it was just cracking up. <laughs> the, the internet will always be undefeated. Our favorite WTI um, realist out there. Um, absolutely hilarious. Nothing else really, Stu, on the docket for today from an oil and gas side. Again, we, 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 Southwestern Chesapeake, we've, we've got the news of BP rumbling out there. Everyone's kind of outside of that, though. It's kind of all quiet on the Western front for us. What else should people be scared about? I don't know. We need to have you ask a new question in the future. Uh, you know, I, you can I just lie that. and say everything's great. You don't have oh, to be no. honest I, with us. Uh, buckle up, hug your family, and uh, look for some fantastic uh, podcasts. No, it'll be great, guys. Well, as always, we appreciate you checking us out. World's greatest podcast, Energy News Beat. Check us out, www.energynewsbeat.com. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. Thank <laughs> you.